No matter if you go to Instagram, Astrobin or Facebook, there is just one object which you see all over. And that's him, right? Comet C 2022. And so it's no wonder that various people actually ask me to do a video about how to process a comet. And I immediately said yes, and I went outside, and that's how it looked. Actually, it looks like that since October. So no, this is not the comet. It's a mixture out of light pollution and fog. How I could still get the data to show you how it's done and how it is done, I will show you right after the trailer. Hey, this is Fear in the Space. I'm Sasha from Switzerland. So grüezi miteinander and thanks for watching my channel. So what makes a comet so tricky to process? The issue is the following. When you shoot deep space, all the objects are at the same place. So as long as you're guiding, as you're tracking, everything's fine. But now come the comets, which are fast and which are not in line with all the rest of the objects in the sky. And so if you align with the comet, you have star trails. And if you align with the stars, you have the comet all over. So there's two ways how you can deal with that. You can either use a guiding tool like PhD and use as the guiding target the comet. Now the issue is as stated, the star trails. So you have to deal with that in different ways. And also the guiding has to be ultra precise. And otherwise it still looks kind of blurry and, and there's no real way how to deal with that afterwards. The more traditional way is that you still align on the stars. So you have the comet trailing through your picture and then you have specialized processes like the new comet alignment tool in PixInsight. And this is what we're going to try today. Now, as stated, I had no data at all. And so I had two generous people who actually donated data to me. And I want to give a shout out to them. That's on one side, Lynn Jones, which gave me the mono data. And that's on the other side, Hunter Alton, who gave me the RGB data. And so we can actually go now through the processing first in the RGB version and then in the mono version and see how it's done. So let's go now to the computer and try it out. Okay, here we are in PixInsight. And the first thing we do, we open the fully integrated picture that looks like this. And so you see the issue actually with the comet. You see the full trail of the comet uh, looks very unnatural, blurry, so unusable. But what we actually need from here is not the comet, but we need the stars to actually reintegrate them afterwards. So what I actually did here, and I will not bother you with that, is I did an automatic background extraction, then I let the blur exterminator run over it, and then I let the star exterminator run over it with the star map on, and these are our stars. That's what we need. So with that, we can say hasta la vista to the integrated picture, and we have here our stars. Now they're not stretched yet, as you can see, so we stretch them now. We actually use for that first the arc sign stretch. As it is a star map, we can leave the black point where it is. We make a preview and we're moving it up until about like here. We execute it and no, we're not going on. <laughs> so we're exiting arc sign stretch here and we're opening the generalized hyperbolic stretch. Again, a preview, we're sitting here as usual our SP point sent to SP, go back, local intensity to about a nine. And we're moving up here until we're getting nice stars. And here with actually with the comet, we can have quite pronounced stars because it's not like there's a nebula, which, um, which we shouldn't disturb too much. But here actually the stars really belong to the comet and they fill in all the black space around the comet. So that looks actually nice having some, some rather large stars, colorful stars. And I think that looks already about good. So I wouldn't do that much anymore. Let's execute it. And I will even slightly stretch it a little bit further like this. And then I'm actually happy. I'll exit here. 
So there's something else which we have to do. And you see it right here when we zoom in. So that's still what is left over from the comet. And we should actually remove that. So for that, we take the clone stamp tool. Okay, so we click in the picture. We enlarge the radius to about 40. We take some nice black area here with the control key. Now we're moving over. We start removing all this greenish stuff here. That's about okay. And if we now zoom out, that looks okay. Nobody sees that anymore. So that's good. So we minimize this now and we will use that later on. So while star processing was still kind of business as usual, now comes the real fun, the comet. So what you need for that are the pictures calibrated, debayered and registered. Just a regular registration that you would do with a normal deep space stack but they should not be integrated yet. So these pictures, we will now enter into the comet alignment process. And you find that in image registration, comet alignment. So the first thing we do, we go to add files. I have here these files. So they're in now. What we also need is an output directory. I call it comet align. And now comes the interesting part. So you click now on show first image and it takes the first image timeline wise. Use the screen transfer function to stretch it. And now with the cross, we go in the middle of the nucleus and we click and you see the circle around. So that's fine. Now we go show last image and we do exactly the same again, screen transfer function and we click it. And that is in principle, all it needs as long as you have regular shots which means you did not make breaks you did not shift the telescope or anything like that as long as you just regularly shot through the night it should be okay now we click on apply global and let it run okay and here we go so how can we know now if it worked or not very easy we go to process Blink, and we load everything that was now aligned in Blink. So once Blink is open, what you do is you zoom in. So until the nucleus is really, really big, like this. And then we start here the video function, and we put the crosshairs right on the nucleus, and now it shouldn't move. The stars move, but the nucleus doesn't move. And that's exactly what happens here. And this is our confirmation that the comet alignment worked. If now the nucleus would dance around, then it would be corrupt and we would have to start all over again. But here, perfect. So we know it worked and we can continue our efforts. So now the next thing we have to do is we have to remove the stars. There's some proposals out there that actually the outlier rejection in the integration would remove the stars. I tried it and I did not like the results at all. This is not going to fly. It might decrease them, but they're still there. You will still have some star trails. That's not a good option. So and for, and for this next step, you absolutely need the star exterminator. This is something that cannot be done with Starnet. The big advantage that the star exterminator has is it has a batch function only actually since the last version and that's exactly intended for comets. We do not need the star image. We go into process batch. We also have to give here a directory. We say this is starless. And now we click here, select input files and execute. So we enter here our comet align files, open, and we say, okay. And now this takes a while again, but what now happens is star exterminator goes from one picture to the other and removes all the stars. So just as a pre-warning, this takes some time. I cut this out now, but this took about 30 minutes, depending also on your computer, it might be longer or shorter. So we can close now the star exterminator and if you want, we can actually take a peek. So that's now one of my starless shots. Nice. 
every star is removed. Really cool. Next, we have now to integrate the whole thing. Another lengthy step. So we go process, image integration, image integration. We click on add files, go to the starless, select them all, open and they're in. Now here combination, we leave on average. Normalization, we say no normalization. Weights, we go on don't care, all weights like one. We go on pixel rejection, we say Winsert Sigma clipping and everything else we leave as it is. And we click on global and the whole thing is running. Okay, so the integration is through, so we can close this down. We have, as usual, the two rejection maps and then the integration. As you can see, the rejection maps are practically empty. That's good. So let's look now what we have here. And at the moment, that looks a little bit scary, a little bit green, but okay, we can deal with that. So to get this green cast away, we go to process screen transfer function. We unlink it up here and we just press the new clip button again. And look here, everything looks fine. Next thing we want to clean up the gradients. So I will actually go now to the dynamic background extraction and let's add here some samples. Let's go up to tolerance. We can definitely also increase the sample size here. So we anyway don't have any stars. We go to subtraction and let's run it. And this looks now much, much better. And we see exactly, you see, all this vignette thing is gone now. We could do now here a traditional color calibration if it would be needed, but this looks like it should be with the greenish tone. So I don't even do that. I feel this is okay. In the same way we could do here an SCNR if it would be overly green, given that this is a green comment again, I don't want to remove this green, this belongs here. But this is individual picture for picture, comment for comment. So you have these tools and you can use them if needed. Next question, does it make sense to use here the blur exterminator given there are no stars? And the easiest thing to say to do is let's try it. So we create here a clone, then we can compare it afterwards. We take the Blur Exterminator and I actually measured the PSF based on the star picture and it's 2.95. So I entered that here and we let it run. It's done now. Here without the Blur Exterminator, here with the Blur Exterminator and comparing the pictures, it makes almost no difference at all. I don't see any difference. So from that point of view, if we do not see any difference, we're not going to do it. But what definitely makes a lot of sense here, and we see it in the background, is the noise exterminator. So I'll let it run. Okay, and that looks much better. So now next step, we have to stretch the picture. And for that, we use the generalized hyperbolic stretch. We get a preview. So we're zooming in. We're looking for the curve. Go for now, right in the middle, send to SP. We're going with the local intensity. To about nine and we start to stretch and here comes our comet we just stretch slightly okay sending it again to sp we go now with a five stretch a little bit further and now it's a balance we do not want the background to lighten up too much but we want the comet to lighten up. And so we have to play here a little bit with the local intensity, with the symmetry point, until we get what we want. We also definitely want to protect the highlights so that the nucleus is not blown out or not blown out more than it already is. You have seen it is already quite a little tiny bit blown out. So this comes nicely. I already stretched that again, so I go really incremental. So let's go back here, again, send to SP. We're going now to about a three. And you see, if I now move the symmetry point a little bit out, to a certain degree, this helps. And I really like this now. So the next thing is, I'm going now to linear. Just enter something in the low clip. And let's play now with the black point. 
We don't want to go too black, but we definitely want to go blacker than we were. Nice. We don't even lose anything. We're clipping not, but you see, it really helps. So we're doing that. So I feel that already looks now really, really nice. So the next tool we're going to use is the exponential transformation. And you will see what it does. It brings a lot of luminosity. You will see how much is still nice. It obviously also lightens up the background a bit again, but we can mitigate that afterwards. But we get a lot more glow on the comet. Probably one is a little bit too much, but that's actually nice. So let's do it like this. The last cleanup we can do with the curve transformation. So what I'm gonna do now, I'll set here some control points, and then what we mostly want is to darken the background a bit. We do not want to highlight the upper part anymore. So I think that's already good. That's all I wanted to do here. Okay, and that's our comet. So now as a last step, we have to combine the comet with the stars. Remember the stars? Here they are. So how do we do that? As you might have already seen from other tutorials, I like to kind of protect the main object from the stars. Sometimes just half, but here I think what I want is just really the, the main part of the comet, but I really want to protect it fully from the stars. So we need a range mask. So let's have a preview. But I want to have this range mask really, really, really tight. You see, so only the very, very core I want to have protected. So I execute now and let's put this mask on. And that's exactly what I want here, the core. But I want to protect the core. So I invert it. Exactly. So we call this here starless. And we call this here stars. So what we need now is pixel math. And this is the formula that I use. This is the inverse formula that Star Exterminator uses to move the stars out. Throw this now on here. Can close this down. We unmask it. And here we go. So the last thing we have to do with our picture is we have to crop it a little bit. And here we go. But wait, we're not finished yet. Because there was another question. How do you do it? if you have mono data. And quite honestly, I also had to get my head around it because it's not like we shoot the RGBs like together, but we shoot them in sequence. First the Rs, then the G, then the Bs. So while the comet is still moving, so the Bs are not at the same place as the Gs or the Rs. So I think what is absolutely crucial here is that when you shoot it, you shoot it in sequence. So don't shoot the Rs one night or make a coffee break in between, but it's really filter wheel and then the Rs, then the Gs, then the Bs. And what you then have is still a continuous path which comet alignment can actually follow. So what we're doing, we throw all the pictures, the blues, the reds, and the greens. We throw them all together in the same bucket here. So we don't process them or we don't comet align them separately, but all together. We also have to give here an output directory. And now we do the same, show first image. So time-wise, whatever color it is, the first image is selected. We mark it here. We go to show last image. We mark it and that's it. Same process as before and we press the button. Okay, it's finished. By the way, I selected here Generate Comet Path Mask. And you see already here, I can actually make this bigger, that it could easily follow the path. That's also a very good sign. So we close down the comet alignment. And as before, let's throw it now all into Blink. Let's zoom in. Let's let it drive. Obviously, I have different brightnesses because of the different colors. But as you see again, the comet, the nucleus, is completely still. It's always in the crosshairs. And so it worked. So that's great. So now I will not continue here because the rest would be repetition. This is the only secret that you really need to know when you shoot mono, that you have actually to comet register them 
together because now again you would remove the stars by batch and then you would obviously integrate by channel the reds the blues and the greens separately and then at one point like you do with mono you do then the color combination so i hope you could go along with your data and you have the same success as i had if you want to have the whole workflow on an nice pdf you will find that on my Patreon page, and I'll leave a link to that in the description below. See you next time, and clear skies.